to eliminate stigma. One of the things that's really important is that we need people to feel comfortable um, seeking help and saying I have a memory problem and getting an early diagnosis because we know the earlier we treat people the more successful we are. And one of the reasons we probably aren't as successful with treatment as we need to be is because people are still identifying too late in the process. Um, we want to ensure people get care in, the, um, in care where they want to, want to be cared for. Uh, we want to, for the reasons I described today, uh, develop a comprehensive approach uh, to family caregivers. Uh, we need to address the needs of our multicultural society here in California particularly. We need people who know how to care for a person of another back, uh, cultural background or uh, who speaks other language. Uh, advancing research, I've made that point, and our state infrastructure here in California could also be improved in terms of all the various departments that have their hands in Alzheimer's disease and how those things are coordinated and, and, and enhanced in the delivery of different uh, levels of care. Um, the national plan that was just released recognizes uh, the urgency of the matter and has set uh, a goal to prevent and effectively treat Alzheimer's disease by 2050. Again, you see the same themes, improving care quality, expanding supports, uh, enhancing public awareness and understanding the disease, and also doing a better job of tracking our outcomes, what's, what's effective, what's not effective, um, and putting things into practice that we know are going to work. So I just wanted to say a couple of words about where I come from down at UCI, um, and uh, we are very proud to uh, be a California Alzheimer's Disease Center, and our leader is sitting over there, Dodie Terrell, here at the state level. Um, and we're also proud to be an Alzheimer's Disease Research Center through uh, the NIH. Um, so at UCI Mind, we're an institute, and we have three uh, primary um, and components of what we do. And one is our basic science um, research, um, where we're really looking for things like biomarkers, you know, are there ways to identify um, uh, the changes uh, that occur right now in cerebral spinal fluid, uh, eventually in blood, uh, what are the markers, where can those be identified? Even there's one very interesting study uh, that has been going on where a researcher is collecting teardrops to see if the uh, changes, the abnormal proteins in Alzheimer's disease can be measured in something as simple as a tear um, to see if someone's at risk. Um, we are um, doing work on stem, with stem cells. We have a memory assessment at Research Center and that's where our um, California Alzheimer's Disease Center operates. I've got a slide on that and what our primary goals are. But we also um, follow um, a longitudinal uh, cohort of individuals, so people who come in and participate in research and come back every year and are reevaluated and contribute their brains at death. And we have people with early um, uh, Alzheimer's, with MCI, early Alzheimer's. We also have a group of healthy people, it's our successful aging program, so we can compare. Uh, people who are having some impairment with people who are healthy and see what's happening there. Uh, we have a unique cohort of individuals who are the oldest old, 90 plus, to see uh, how these diseases affect them and also um, a cohort of individuals with Down syndrome who all develop the neuropathological changes of Alzheimer's disease and provide a genetic model uh, for Alzheimer's because we know there's a connection on chromosome uh, 21. And then we do education and outreach, and so I'm, I'm here educating, and um, we are out in our community educating our community about Alzheimer's disease. We provide, um, obviously, a source of expertise to our local um, community on this. We train professionals in our clinic, for example, medical residents, psychology practicum students, and so forth, who come into our clinic, um, and so that we can contribute to the workforce, professional, and um, also um, care, uh, formal caregivers that, that we need to develop for the future. 
So um, our California Alzheimer's disease centers have been around, as you can see, for a long time, uh, with their uh, major goals being the following, to train future providers, uh, that workforce we need, to um, uh, draw down federal funds to help to um, be, um, to leverage, to leverage other resources to make significant difference in uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we diagnose complex cases from the community and uh, we serve minority individuals. That's a real focus of our, um, in 2009, our programs underwent a 50% cut. And again, I think the state needs to look towards building and not taking away from the infrastructure, whether it's our California Alzheimer's Disease Centers, which are involved in the diagnosis and identification of people with Alzheimer's disease are serving the underserved on our community, or it's things like the Caregiver Resource Center, which are out there trying to support the families. And just a brief video, and I hope this works, so we'll see what happens here. Whoops. Wait, that's not what it was supposed to do, so I think I did something wrong, so let me backtrack. Uh, I think this is what I was supposed to do. I hit the wrong place. Why is that not working? Uh oh Well, you know what? Um, I'm going to try one other thing. I'm not, uh, if this is not going to work. I'm not sure why it's not connecting to the video. When it was working beautifully, before, when I had this memory stick in my uh, home computer a little bit ago, uh, um, I'm going to try it one more time. Otherwise, I'm going to do it a different way. Um, uh, let's do it this way. This should, hopefully, we'll do it this way. Um, and we need to get some sound, though. That's up. Did you turn on? Yep, there it goes. Did, did they plug speakers in? Great. Nice. We got it. Yeah. Oh. Are they up as high as they go? Yeah. There you go. It turns out that if you're over 55 years of age, you have a 1 in 8 shot of developing Alzheimer's disease. So 1 out of every 20 people over the age of 65 suffers from Alzheimer's disease, and that number doubles every 5 years thereafter. That means 1 out of every 10 people over the age of 70, 1 out of every 5 people over the age of 75, and 1 out of every 2 to 3 people over the age of 80 to 85. If you don't yet know someone with Alzheimer's disease, chances are pretty high that you will in the very near future, and it may even be scary because that person might be you. The youngest person that I've ever heard of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease was 33 years of age. I would say UCI Mind is considered one of the leading centers for Alzheimer's disease research. The uh, fantastic thing about UCI is the collaboration between the different groups and the interactions. So that's the best environment for fostering the development of grad students and postdocs. Here at UCI, we research all the way from the bench through to the bedside. So one of the things we're really most excited about are some of our experiments in stem cells. And what we found is that these cells can improve learning and memory. The way that they're doing this is incredibly unique. It's something we've never seen before in the lab. Uh, and it's really opened up an avenue of, of research for us to explore other potential treatments. There are, are several drugs that are on the market currently that provide a modest benefit to at least some patients. There's many drugs that are in clinical trials or in late stages of preclinical trials. I think within the next five years you're going to see some pretty impressive breakthroughs. That's my prediction. Do we have a better understanding of the risk factors that lead to Alzheimer's disease? Do we have a better understanding of the genetics underlying this disease? Do we have a better understanding of the disease mechanism that underlies the process? The answer to that is yes, absolutely. Do we have a treatment for Alzheimer's disease or a cure that's coming on the market today or tomorrow? Then of course the answer is no. Every time you see Nancy, you see a smile on her face. I miss the smiles a lot. When, when your mind goes 
and and you can't do your normal daily activities, you can't take care of your family, that's a hugely devastating thing, and that's what UCI Mind focuses on. After I started doing research with Dr. Frank LaFerla on Alzheimer's disease, I found out that my mom has Alzheimer's disease, and it's had a really um, definite impact on the family, but it's also put kind of a fire in my belly to really pursue this in um, terms of getting our research right to the clinics and helping people as best we can. We went through the testing, and we had the, the final results where they give you, uh, you had the family meet with Dr. Malcolm Dick. I don't know if everybody gets to meet with Dr. Malcolm Dick. We did. And you're in a private room, and he has the brain scans, and he has all the tests that were done, the written tests and the scores and everything. And his, apparently, he's supposed to tell the family what, what the challenge is and where we're going to go forward. He chose to do something totally different. Knowing Nancy was a clinician like him, he said, Nancy, we're not going to give this to the family. You and I, as medical people, are going to go over these results and decide what the answer is and what we should do. And the respect that he showed by doing that was so immensely important to Nancy. It made a lot of difference in her attitude towards moving forward as opposing to fighting. Alzheimer's doesn't get very much funding from the government relative to other diseases. I believe that part of that is due to the fact that they think it's an old people's disease. It is not an old people's disease. 50 is not old. I know one doctor at UCI Mind told me that he had a 40-year-old woman with kids under five that's diagnosed with the disease. It's a disease that a lot of people are getting. And as we get older in the demographic, there are going to be more and more people who lose their life at a time when they should be flourishing. If this, is, this epidemic of dementia that we're facing over the next 20, 10, 20, and 30 years is going to be really devastating for the country economically. 30 years ago, this country made a concerted effort to, to invest in trying to find treatments for cancer. And it's taken 30 years, but they're making huge strides. And in the case of things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, it's going to take a while. It's not going to happen overnight. But we need to invest now that maybe 20, 30 years from now we'll, we'll reap the rewards and when those diseases will be treatable. Donations and other sources of income are absolutely crucial for our continued success. It takes so much money. It takes dedication. I'm convinced the dedication is there. The facilities are there. But the money isn't there in UCI mind. It needs to be. It needs to be. Nancy would just absolutely want that. UCI mind is Orange County's only federal and state designated Alzheimer's disease research center and clinic. But we're more or less going to own all of Alzheimer's disease. You know, we will be the center of Alzheimer's disease education and outreach in Orange County. I'm really proud of that fact. Come join UCI Mind. Okay. <clears throat> so, anybody have any questions? Comments? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how other countries are dealing with the problem or preparing to deal with the problem? Um, there are. I. I'm not sure I'm well versed in that, however there are many countries or several countries that have developed actually plans for Alzheimer's disease. The United States was late uh, to do that, um, but uh, I can't speak to any specific strategies that other countries are using. Yeah, go ahead. I have a couple of questions. Considering the extreme impact of Alzheimer's among the older population, I would expect older people vote a lot, they're connected to people with Alzheimer's. Why are we not seeing more government interest in Alzheimer's research, in home supportive services, etc.? Well, Alzheimer's disease is the most feared disease among Americans 55 years and older. And I, 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 people, you know, in order to be proactive, and advocate and do that, you have to not run away from something. And most people in our society are running away from Alzheimer's disease. And what we need to do with Alzheimer's disease is face it head on. 
that means we have to accept the reality of it and accept that it could affect us and all of those things. And I think people just don't want to go there. I think that's part of it. I, I also, when you talk about families with Alzheimer's disease, though, even though there's so many of them, once you become a caregiver, you're wasted. I mean, it's hard to advocate or to be proactive. And people with Alzheimer's disease themselves, until recently, now that we're identifying people earlier, some people are being advocates for themselves, but patients can't go out there and advocate, like cancer patients who will go out and advocate, who are very capable of that. People affected by Alzheimer's disease um, have, have limited and then no ability to advocate for themselves, so they become a very hidden part of our uh, society. The other question is far afield. I have heard rumors that marijuana is supposed to be effective in reducing the incidence of Alzheimer's. Do you know anything about that? Uh, those are rumors. In other <laughs> words, um, there's all kinds of rumors. The most recent one, oh, uh, one of the most recent ones was the one about coconut, you know, and um, uh, as far as anything along that line, it's all anecdotal, so there's no scientific evidence that would suggest that it's beneficial. Yes? Um, you mentioned, um, from a policy perspective, addressing, you know, making it a workplace better for caregivers, and there was a bill this year in the California legislature that was um, protect, addressing discri caregiver dis discrimination, mm. um, and I don't know if you had a comment on that, or there was quite vigorous debate on the floor uh, where people said that it would harm business, and so what can we do to convince people that this well, is good business practice? <laughs> I think that, the, and I don't have the number off the top of my head, and I meant to write that down, but you need to go to the Alzheimer's Disease Facts and Figures Report. And people who say that need to understand the cost to business. I mean, there is a huge just cost to businesses. Businesses are losing money. When I call in sick, you know, and I, because I need to take care of my mom, when I'm distracted at work and I'm making calls to... Uh, scheduled doctor's appointments and there is actual data on how much businesses are losing financially um, and that's really I think the best argument for that because it's all you know for businesses I mean this is too stereotypical for me to say this but it's all about money right so you need to tell they need to learn that they're actually losing more money by not doing anything I know this is very unpopular, but unfortunately, I actually think the mood at the moment is that that's why you try to limit or reduce the number of employees altogether. Um, and I guess the other thing that I would like to say that's also unpopular, I, I, I kudos to you for your work. I think it's amazing, and clearly, we, it is an issue that needs to be more aggressively addressed. But I also think part of that whole denial about wanting to address it is because we are a culture of paramount denial. Because it seems to me, in addition, there should also be an ongoing conversation about end of life and right to die when the going is horrid. It's a facing it. And nobody wants to have that conversation or go there. And I, it's interesting in terms of the Canadian baby boomer report, because we've also did, well, we, we did an interesting survey around baby boomers as well. And many of them are not choosing uh, long-term care because they actually anticipate ending their lives when they can't take it any longer. And I think that's just a fascinating, that, and, but no, we don't want to talk about that. We don't want to talk about what that might look like and how we could actually do it in a kind and compassionate way and actually help people come to the end of their lives. Right, that's true. I mean, I think you know that's absolutely true. No matter where you fall on that particular debate, the fact is that anything that has to do with aging, disability, right. uh, Alzheimer's disease, end of life is something we don't want to look at. Uh, I always tell the story, uh, many years ago now, my husband and I were in Toronto, and the thing that has, stood, has stayed with me from that trip was that one day we were out, and there was actually a caregiver with an individual that was on a rolling bed. They were like, it, I had never seen one before, but it was like, the first thing I said to my husband was, I never see that in Newport Beach, California, you know, so we do have this huge societal, societal cultural hurdle to overcome um, regarding these issues. Anything else? Yes. I mean, yeah, back to the question about why isn't there more about this. 
I mean, I think, or why are now we're just starting to see more about it, is that, you know, the incidents, I mean, the, the raw numbers are really impressive, but also when you take into account the raw numbers relative to size of family, um, you yeah. know, when you have five kids in a family, the odds of one of those kids being the primary caregiver for their Alzheimer's patient, mother or father, is at a particular level. But when you go down to like two kids in a family, then all of a sudden you're starting to get at a 50% hit rate in terms of someone taking responsibility for it. And so I think, you know, the two things are going in tandem, so it's not just raw numbers that are increasing, it's also the incidence with which people are really affected by the proximity of a loved one that has the problem. Right, and that, that makes sense. And I mean, I think another related point to that is not only the baby boomer generations, but the generations after that. I mean, we, you know, um, we all know that one of the reasons Social Security may not be funded well is because we don't have as many young people working. Well, that's another reason we're not going to have as many family caregivers in the future is we're, have, we're going to be upside down, you know, the upside down pyramid with a small base and a large number of older adults at the top. So, well, thank you all for your attention. Oh, I'm not. 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 Oh, I'm not.